Um, so we discussed uh, discovery of neutron last time. Today I will start with uh, hypothesis of Wolfgang Pauli. in 1930, who introduced new hypothetical particle. To resolve the problems with uh, beta decay, with uh, paradoxes, which have been observed in beta decay. Probably some of you already learned this, but please keep in mind, so I'm trying to keep the level so that uh, most of uh, you understand. And also please keep in mind that I'm trying also to add something which is uh, probably not known for those who already had these courses. So, Wolfgang Pauli introduced this new particle and it was extremely unusual this time because people thought that the um, number of uh, elementary objects which actually compose the, what they observe should be very small. So it's like a, almost like a crime if you introduce some new particle. It's not like, like today. So you are opening spires or spires and you see uh, 10 papers with, and each introduces, say, 10 new particles, so now it's uh, common. And now we know that the number of particles are thousands. But at that time, people knew a okay, proton, electron, and they thought probably it should be some very minimal number of uh, new objects. And therefore, introduction of uh, something new was really unusual. So, Pauli wanted to resolve the problem of uh, beta decay. Of nuclei. So what is this? One example actually which people studied extensively was bismuth decay. And final state polonium plus electron. So, transition between two nuclei and the emission of electrons. So this is beta decay. Electrons are identified uh, as uh, beta rays. This car is the neutrino. So, so, that was what people saw. Okay. Now, this decay has been studied extensively by Chadwick, actually starting from 20s or even earlier he, sta he started to observe uh, this type of the decays and uh, some other beta decays have been observed. So what are the paradoxes? The first one is uh, continuous energy spectrum. Energy spectrum of electrons. So people observe the case of, of many uh, nuclei of bismuth, and so they could construct, and this is what Chadwick did, the distribution of number of events over neutrino energy. So here is a number of events. And then what happened is that in different decays of bismuth, electron appeared with different energies. And uh, the energy spectrum, what we call energy spectrum, the distribution of events over the energy of electron was continuous. So, so usually experimentalists are doing the following, they have beams, and then count of number of events with electron uh, energy in a given beam. So, experimental point, experimental measurements look like you have uh, this type of the histogram, uh -huh. something like that.
So why it is unusual? Unusual because people were expecting that it should be a line so that all the electrons have the same energy. It is expected. Which equals the end point of the spectrum. So this Q is end point spectrum. It's called. And if you neglect recoil of uh, this final nuclei, then uh, this Q is just given by the difference of masses of initial and final nuclei. That's bismuth minus mass of uh, balloon. And that's what people have seen studying um, gamma, a decays with emission of gammas. So the people had this already of uh, quantum nature and what was expected kind of uh, exact uh, energy of, of electron, like uh, say exact energy of uh, gammas or x-rays when you have atomic transitions. So this is what is expected and it was, has been observed. And uh, that was kind of puzzling. And uh, there were some ideas how to explain this. And one of ideas was that energy is not conserved. So people even went to such an extent that better to introduce energy non-conservation or kind of average energy conservation. So something which is average in the spectrum is conserved rather than introduce new particles. So this is one paradox, this continuous spectrum. And the second one is related to spin, angular momentum conservation. So that days, uh, the paradox was called as violation. of uh, spin statistics relation. So what is this? So it's more sophisticated than this, uh, essentially, uh, statement of uh, conservation of the angular momentum at quantum level. So what is this? So we call that Bose statistic, Bose system with both statistics is for the system with uh, integer spins. And uh, Fermi statistics for the system with semi-integer spins. So and the idea was that <coughs> statistics is conserved in various transitions. So if you have some process where you have initial state which has certain statistics, then final state should also have the same statistics. So conservation of statistics. So in this process, or the process of beta decay, bismuth has spin zero, and so it was Bose statistics. So one would expect that uh, final state should also have Bose statistics. However, you have electron in final state, which has semi-integer spin, so then the question is what's going on? And then it was formulated that here, Bose statistics is conserved, however, relation between spin and statistics is violated. Okay. Well, in modern terms, is nothing but what we see here, apparent violation of quantum
Angular Momentum kanssa ruis. So, the Angular Momentum is not conserved here at quantum level, right? Independently what is orbital motion of a final particle. Here you have semi-integer spin, there is integer spin and in initial state. So what was Paolo's idea? Paolo hypothesis is that a new particle, additional particle, is emitted in beta decay. And I will use our modern notations. So this particle should be light. This particle should be light. Uh, smaller than mass of the electron. Not to destroy kinematics of the process. It should be neutral. charge is zero and it should have spin one half so it should be prime and power they call this particle neutron that was before discovery of neutron right and after neutron was discovered the Fermi called this particle neutrino Surprisingly, people haven't accepted immediately this explanation, and uh, many resisted to accept this very simple explanation of all the facts of beta decay. So clearly, with this idea, you can have an uh, explanation of everything. And at first, now the total energy release is Q is actually shared between electron and neutrino. So the energy is conserved. However, in different events you may have different energies of electron and corresponding energy of neutrino. So they share and so therefore the energy of electron can be from zero. Obviously it should be mass of electron, right? The minimum if it is not kinetic. So when energy of neutri when energy of neutrino is zero and it can be maximal, it can be up to Q. Uh, the end point, so if no, this, if, this is if, if this is large, right? If it is close to Q. And it can be Q if energy of neutrino is close to zero. So uh, any intermediate uh, distribution is possible. Second, since spin of the neutrino is one half, you immediately uh, can satisfy angular momentum conservation because you have uh, two particles with spin one half, and uh, here the spin is integer, and here the spin is also integer. So you can satisfy this uh, this uh, this relation. And finally, since uh, the neutri this neutrino is its mass is light you essentially do not distort uh, the spectrum, it doesn't show in kinematics. So, it was also clear that this particle should have very weak interactions, other interactions, not only electromagnetic, since it has the charge uh, equal zero, it has no electromagnetic interactions, closed order, but it has also not other interactions, and therefore you cannot detect, you do not see effects of this emitted neutrino in further interactions. The key question was, and remember we discussed something like that last lecture, is how neutrino is kept inside the nuclei. Again, the idea was that still the particles which are emitted are somehow sit are sitting in nuclei. 
and then you have uh, a, a possibility that these particles are emitted. Uh, but neutrinos have very weak interactions. It's clear, and uh, they are neutral. It's not clear how neutrinos were sitting inside the nuclei. Questions? Okay, so then we move to the Fermi theory of big interactions. By the way, how many of you know about Feynman diagrams of solids? Not quite, quite substantial. Good. Hmm. And how many made the computations? So, actually in my course, I'm not assuming that you know what are these Feynman rules and uh, I did the computation. And in fact, some of you do not, didn't do this. Um, but you will see that many things can be, can be done even and computed without uh, even a, a knowledge of this technique. So, and please ask me questions if you see uh, something. Maybe at the end of the course, because you have a parallel electrodynamics course and uh, Giovanni will introduce certainly in five other rules, at least in QED. So, at the end of the course, you, you also know what is this technique and how to do computations. Now, Fermi theory of beta decays. So, this is very important step in development of uh, particle physics, modern particle physics. Of beta decay. So Fermi created the theory in 1934, and actually he had a problem to publish paper on the theory. However, he likes this, and, and he thinks that this is one of his major uh, achievements in his scientific life, creation of the theory. And you also will see that everything is quite simple. Right? So once you know already, posteriori, everything is simple. And I will show you this many, many times in the course. So what Fermi did, he incorporated discovery of neutron, and soon after discovery of neutron, the model of nuclei composed of protons and neutrons has been created by Heisenberg. And Ivanenko. That was in 1932. So that according to this model, nuclear consists of protons and neutrons, and then there is no, this what we have discussed, confusion that we can reproduce correct mass of the nuclei and uh, correct charges of the nuclei. The second point he incorporated in his theory, discovery of neutrino. Or power hypothesis. What he used heavily is analogy. Analogy is extremely important heuristic principle when you develop something. So, if you see some new facts, what you will try first, try to use analogy with what you already learned. And uh, that has a deep sense. It seems that nature really has uh, this unity in the sense that the same rules, the same laws can be uh, actually realized in completely different systems. So it's not so, this is kind of not so, not so 
a stupid thing, right, to use analogy to what you already learned before. And this is the first step what people are doing. So, in this case, Fermi used analogy with electromagnetic interactions. So let me recall, you will learn this, of course, in this QED course, is what are electromagnetic interactions? Interactions of charged particles, for instance, electron with photon gap. So this is, this is electromagnetic interaction. Hamiltonian, or weak interactions, can be written as the charge then wave function of electron, gamma mu, wave function of electron, and electromagnetic field. Mu is this for index gamma and its gamma matrix. Okay? So this is for electron, but then you add, need to add such a terms for other charged particles. Everything what is charged has coupling with, with, uh, with photon, with gamma, and uh, the coupling constant is given by electric charge. Now, let me still ask. So if you have some question, what does it mean? Huh? So that's Hamiltonian, which we are using to compute electromagnetic processes. Processes are due to interactions of atoms, photons with uh, charged particles. So these are the fields. And you see this diagram, what is meaning? So you have electron here, you have electron final state and gamma. You can treat this as a transition between electron with emission of gamma and electron. Of course, this doesn't happen in vacuum because you cannot satisfy energy momentum conservation. However, you may have the processes when you have another gamma here, for instance. Uh, something like this here, you can satisfy energy momentum conservation. And this is the second order process in electromagnetic interactions because you have one interaction in this vertex and another is in this vertex. Now here are the fields which eventually quantize and they depend on the coordinates x, here x, and here x. And all three fields involved in interactions are taken in the same space-time point. Well, eventually when you do computations, of course, you integrate over uh, time and uh, configuration space. So, but elementary interaction is described by this Hamilton. In that time, did they know already about experiment diagrams? No, it was, Feynman was, the computations yeah, so were kind of rather yeah. sophisticated, but uh, I will use uh, modern language. Actually, I will not use much of these diagrams, but it was clear that it should be interaction of the fields. Uh, so these three fields in one point, so that, yeah, so they have a, a way to visualize it even without that thing. Yeah. So what is important feature of this of this term is that this block, which is psi, you are conjugate gamma, and here again psi, is called current. Right? So this is current. And in fact, there's a deep analogy with just usual current. If you go to classical level, the components of, uh, of this current really reproduce for you what we know from classical physics. For instance, zero component would give you just density of, of electrons, and other components will be density multiplied by velocity, which is really current. Now, the key point of uh, Fermi theory and his major idea, which is, which looks quite trivial now, but it was by far not very trivial at that time, is the following, that the pair of neutrino or antineutrino and electron emitted in beta decay, and remember how beta decay looks like, I have a nuclei, initial one, then emission of the antineutrino and electron, and then final nuclei. So it was bismuth, here is polonium. So we have here emission of these two 
what we call now leptons, neutrino and, and electron in this transition. What Fermi said that actually neutrino and electrons are not contained somehow in initial nuclei, but they are produced, or they do not exist in initial state, but they are produced in the same way as we have production of gamma, so you have particle, say proton, for instance, proton, and can emit gamma. So this gamma doesn't exist in the initial state of, of proton, but it is emitted, it is produced. And what he is saying is, in this an in analogy with QED, uh, we have here emission of pair of uh, neutrino and electron. And this pair, in a sense, is analogy of gamma in electromagnetic process. Okay? So this is X and here is X. Here is a neutron and proton. And one can see that uh, beta decay uh, actually is transition of one of the neutrons inside the nuclei to the proton with emission of pair neutrino and electron. So that was qualitative key point actually. It's very non-trivial to say that oh neutrino and electron do not exist in the initial state somehow in the system. So they are produced. This is something new which is are produced due to interactions. So what is he saying is that instead of gamma, now in the case of weak interaction of, of beta decay, I have antineutrino and electron. So which means that electromagnetic field I substitute by the current to have Lorentz covariance, right? So I have here electromagnetic field in electrodynamics, which appears here with index mu. And now I need to, to compose something out of these fields, neutrino and electron, which has also index mu. And only what you can write is this. Well, it may be more complicated structure here. It can be gamma 5 or something like this. But gamma mu should be present. With this, you can immediately write the Hamiltonian of which is responsible for beta decay. And how we will write this? We have proton, gamma mu, neutron. And now, just for brevity, I will not write the wave functions like psi with indices. I will write it immediately this kind of uh, notations of the particles. But you should understand that these are operators or in general fields, right, of, of which correspond to proton. So this you should write because we have transition between neutron and proton. Here we would have proton to proton, right? So like here I can write in the case of electromagnetic interactions E. Uh, proton, gamma mu, proton uh, with the opposite sign because the charge is different and here is A mu. So this is what I would write for the diagram on the left hand side. And now for beta decay what I'm writing is N neutron to proton and then my neutrino, um, my pair, so it will have electron pair. So gamma mu, mu, and some coupling here, which is in the modern notation, so it's written like this. Plus I need to write Hermitian conjugate, because my Hamiltonian, which is energy, which should be Hermitian, therefore I write Hermitian, which corresponds to, say, now neutron will be here, proton will be here, and then exchange. Questions?
so this is essentially content of, of Fermi great paper, right, on, on weak interaction. This is the first theory of weak interactions. And all the fields here are taken in the same space-time point. So I will not write here, so just for... So all they depend on the same space-time point, which means that interaction occurs locally in one point. So all four fields, all four interact, particles are interacting in, in the same space-time point. So this is this is fantastic Hamiltonian, which actually works well uh, at low energies with some small corrections. Instead of gamma, I need to write more sophisticated thing, and I will explain this later. And so, coupling, how do you determine that experimentally? Oh, this coupling. Huh? Because once you know Hamiltonian, you can compute the rate of the process, in oh. particular the rate of, uh, of okay. uh, beta decay. Oh. And just knowing this, you immediately uh, find what is GF. I will show you this soon. Now let us explore properties of this Hamiltonian. is, of course, it's Lorentz invariant, as it should be. Right? So it's Lorentz invariant because you have gamma mu here, you have gamma mu here. Second, it has structure current times current. This object is current, right? this object is also current, and so the Lorentz structure of this Hamiltonian is current times current. So we introduce, uh, we can write this Hamiltonian in the form GF square root of 2 and uh, hydronic current multiplied by electronic current. where hadronic current is proton is gamma and I put gamma mu neutron and uh, leptonic current is uh, nu gamma mu and uh, sorry electron and here I have conjugate and therefore that turns and I will get the form which is written on the right hand side. So this we call nowadays leptonic current. So these are leptons made of leptons and this is hadronic current because they, it's made of uh, strongly interacting particles, proton and neutron, which we call now hadrons. So this is hadronic current and, uh, and leptonic current. So, again using analogy, actually Fermi might be abused too much analogy. So, he used this gamma in analogy with electromagnetic interactions. In electromagnetic interactions we have gamma, so that what actually he started to use. But in fact, what should stay, and we will eventually come to this conclusion, it should be gamma mu, big gamma, which is gamma mu, 1 minus gamma 5. So this is true expression for uh, leptonic current, which means we have gamma, so neutrino, gamma mu 1 minus gamma 5 E. For hadronic current, 
That's a little bit more complicated. It should be P gamma mu. Here one minus here some coupling close to one, but not exactly one, gamma five and newton. So these are the forms of the currents which we know now. Uh, appearance of gamma five actually leads to phenomena of parity violation. And by that time people just uh, were against, even in 50s, even in 50s people didn't believe that at fundamental level there is a violation of parity, which means asymmetry between left and right in nature at fundamental level. So that has been established later. But what Fermi used is this one. And what is interesting, that even using these wrong expressions for currents, you can predict very precisely the rates and properties, just because this uh, violation of parity shows up in a more sophisticated way. If you do not follow polarization, for instance, then these parts become irrelevant. So, only when you start to worry about spin and the spin correlations with some other characteristics, with momenta, you can see effects of uh, this uh, violation of pi of gamma phi. However, if you do not care about spin states of your, we just compute the total ray uh, of, uh, of decay and make some integration over spins of some over spins, so that doesn't, is not relevant, and what is relevant is just gamma mu phi. Okay, so another property is that the currents which enter Hamiltonian are charge currents. So electric charge of operator, since uh, this, uh, these are fields, uh, operators at quantum level, so we can talk about electric charge of, for instance, this hadronic current, and this charge is minus one. Because here is antiproton, right? So it's a proton, but <coughs> it's, it's conjugate, which means the charge is minus, charge is zero, and the total charge is minus. Now, the charge of leptonic current so if you look at this, is also minus one and the charge of Hamiltonian is zero because we have conjugate here okay? So it's charge current in contrast to current which appears in uh, QED, in electromagnetic interactions. In the case of electromagnetic interactions, we have transition of electron to electron, or proton to proton. The charge of the particle doesn't change under these under this, uh, uh, interactions. So here we have the change. We have neutron, which is transformed to proton, and here electron which is transformed to neutrino. The charge of the particle changes. And this is because operator has a charge. Now let us consider what is this coupling GF. First of all, what is dimension of this coupling? What is important is that this is not dimensionless coupling like in the case of electromagnetic interactions when you have uh, E, which is in our units is, is just, just constant without any dimension. Dimensionless. Here, what is dimension of GF? to find out this. 
tiene un interés o temas, uh, tiene esas o más. Uh, our our, our uh, universal humans are energies, all masses, if you want. One can look at the Hamiltonian and think what are the dimensions of the uh, Fermi parts, right? Of the Fermi parts. So what is the dimension of Hamiltonian itself? Energy. Yeah, it's mass to the four. Why it's mass to the four? Because this energy density, right? Which means that this is amount of energy in centimeter cube. And remember that we can measure centimeters or distances in inverse of energy. So that will be the same unit as energy square or mass. Sorry, uh, yes, to the four. And so this is dimension of the Hamiltonian. Now, what is the dimension of fermionic field? Hmm? How do we know this? Yeah, for instance, we can take uh, master, and master in Hamiltonian again is m psi bar psi, right? And that should have a dimension mass to the four, mm -hmm. and therefore each of them should have dimension mass to the three or two. Okay? So, correct. This is mass over three or two. So now let us count. We have here four thermionic fields, and therefore dimension of this part is uh, the mass to the six. Dimension of this is mass to the four, and therefore dimension of uh, G Fermi should be one over mass squared. Okay? I think it's already what it should be for, right? Now, what is the size of this coupling? As we already, as I already said, uh, once you know Hamiltonian, you can perform computations, and you can compute the rate of decay. Inverse of rate of decay is lifetime, so it's, uh, you can find what is the lifetime of your of your particle, of your nuclei, and. Decay rate is proportional to GF squared. So when you have the Hamiltonian, what you are doing first, you compute the amplitude of the process, right? So you take Hamiltonian, which is operator, and compute matrix element between initial and final state over the given Hamiltonian, right? So that gives you the amplitude of transition, and then probability is given by moduli square. And the amplitude obviously should be proportional to G F square 2. This is a constant, and so you do some manipulation with this, but that will be staying always. Then you square this and you will get G Fermi square. And then measuring decay rate, so this you measure. You find what is this G Fermi. And numerically, it's very close to 10 to the minus 5 over mass of the proton square. That is just to remember numerical value. It's not, there's not much physics sense in this uh, presentation. You actually can rewrite this as 1 over lambda square absorbing this 10 to the minus 5 into the mass here. And this lambda it turns out to be around 300 GeVs, which has much more sense, as we will see later. OK? Questions? So G Fermi is dimensionful coupling. It has dimensions. 1 over the mass squared, and numerically it's 10 to the minus 5 over the proton mass. So if you remember proton mass, then you can immediately recover, recover uh, 
the valley of this of this coupling. So let me write this is problem mass. Okay. So what is another property of uh, of this Hamiltonian? Locality. I mentioned already this several times. So it's a local interaction, a point like interaction. So all the particles are interacting in the same space time point. You can write this attributing these lines to fermions. So, and all they meet in the same space-time point. Or you can say that you have interactions of two currents in the same space-time point. So that's the same space-time point. What could be alternative to these local interactions? Alternative could be non-local interaction, right? <laughs> and um, you can see that this type of uh, transitions or beta decays are to some extent analogy of electromagnetic interactions in the second order of interactions. So, for instance, there is a process of scattering of electron, electrons on protons. Here we also have two currents, but they are interacting in different space-time points, x here and y here. And <coughs> there is intermediate particle which actually transfer information from point X, point Y, and this is photon. So this is exchange of photon which should produce for us this type of the interactions. So already Fermi observed this analogy. So he was trying to do as much as possible with this analogy principle. What he's saying that maybe beta decay is also not local or weak interaction. But there is also something which mediate interactions of two kinds, similar to what we have here. And uh, then you may have the following neutrino go to electron, here is neutron, proton, and this is some new particle. By the way, here I have written scattering of neutrinos with emission of electron or a neutron or the proton. For uh, beta decay, I should write it as like this. Here it will be anti-neutrino and here is electron. So this is beta decay and this is scattering. So the theory was constructed originally for beta decay, but using algebra of reaction, this Hamiltonian immediately predicts some other processes like here, like scattering of neutrinos, right? So, these are the same particles, but just here I have neutrino in initial state, which actually follows also from this Hamiltonian immediately. So, this is absorption of neutrino, this is emission of electron, this is absorption of a neutron, and this is emission of proton. So, the same Hamiltonian gives me beta decay, if I have a neutrino or anti-neutrino. So that diagram is just different from this one when I put a neutrino to anti-neutrino in final state. This is, a, this is a crossing symmetry then? Right? Sorry? This is the crossing symmetry of uh, S metric. Well, this is just uh, the same Hamiltonian. I don't know. There's not, not, not much symmetry. It's just because the same Hamiltonian describes for you uh, uh, all these processes, because each of these fields, remember, like this one, field of neutrino, or let me put this, field of neutron, 
a field of let me put, a field of neutrino, you expand it on to absorption operator and production operator. So this is the sum of two terms mm -hmm. if you do quantization of your field. And therefore the same field which is staying here contains both production uh, of, uh, of anti-neutrino and absorption of neutrino. Okay? And the same is for, for, for all this. So if you write this Hamiltonian in terms of absorption, uh, annihilation and production operators, then we will have many terms and they will describe uh, our different processes. Yeah. Is the Fermi common constant uh, specified only for beta decay or...? No, for all this. So you, you have written this again and that will be the same for, for such a process. So that's, uh, that process is like this. You have a neutrino at low end, uh, sorry, in, in according to this Hamiltonian that would correspond to this process again, point like. Now, Fermi did uh, next step, he said, oh, probably this is not point-like interaction, but uh, uh, the currents are interacting into different space-time points, and then interactions are mediated by some new particle. And the particle should be vector particle because it couples with vector current. And it should be charged. And it should be charged, and it should be massive, because only in the massive case uh, you will have something like this at low energies. So it looks like point light if you go to low energies. Well, let me say about this a few words. By the way, if this is true, then G Fermi, and you kind of write this diagram, is given by G square over the mass of the W boson square. So let me write some coefficient here, A, which is usually introduced uh, because of uh, the couplings which are staying here. So it's something like that. Okay. So when you compute this diagram, what you will get, you will get G square, which is coupling here, over the mass of the particle, which mediates interaction. And now, it is clear what is the physical meaning of this dimensionful G theory. From this point of view, the mass is the mass squared of mediator of the interactions. Fermi did even next step. He said, oh, maybe this G is also electromagnetic coupling constant. And then he found that MW should be something like 30. GEVs. And I think here he abused this analogy because mm -hmm. so not only in the sense that the current is not purely vector current but axial vector current uh, and here so this is not correct actually. G is bigger than this E electromagnetic coupling constant and therefore the mass of the W boson is bigger than 30 GEVs it's something like 82 GEVs. So Analogy is great principle, but you should be careful, it may not be completely 100% transferred to, to another system. You may still have some, some deviations from that. Now, let me make comments how this corresponds to this, because what we see in beta decays <coughs> is this one, and we do not see that something is exchanged. So, beta decays or processes at low energies looks like you really have point-like interaction. So all particles uh, are interacting at the same point. How this is connected? So if we have the process with the exchange of particle with certain mass, that produces the radius of interaction, which is inverse of this mass of the of, of the exchange particle. You can actually see this um, using uncertainty principle if you want, because clearly this particle is not uh, on the mass shell. This is not real, but it's virtual particle. And you can compute how long this particle can exist. And if you have big deviation from mass shell, from, from reality of the particle, then you can find that this particle mostly can live at the distances 
of inverse of MW. So what you have here, you have say leptonic pair, nu, E, and it emits the, the, this particle W. This is virtual particle, you, you are supposed low energies, far from mass shell, so the deviation from mass shell is one of the mass essentially of this particle, and therefore it can exist at the distances or times which is inverse of this mass, or inverse of virtuality. I don't know if it's clear for everyone, but I will repeat this when we will later discuss introduction of W boson. So that was kind of a source of, uh, of, uh, of error. So, but this is very general. This is why actually in the case of electromagnetic interactions you have an infinite radius of interactions in principle. And so here you have a W boson. And um, so this is the radius of interactions. Now, suppose you have processes with uh, typical momenta P. Uh, then you can introduce the lengths, wavelengths, in, which is inverse of this P. So which means that if you have particles, you scatter particles with momentum P, you probe the distances, you probe structures, which are inverse of P. Remember, we met already this situation. This is very general quantum, quantum situation. So if you have momentum P, then your scattering can be considered as you are looking at the microscope, and the wavelength of your microscope is given 1 over P. And therefore, you can see the structures of the size which is 1 over P with this microscope. So, suppose you have this size of the interactions, and your wave is much bigger. So lambda is much bigger than, than your object or size of the interaction. Then with this microscope, you will not see structure and it will look like a point-like object, right? So this can be written as P is much smaller than the mass of the W boson. I just inverted this relation using that the radius is inverse of MW, uh, MW and lambda is inverse of P. So the conclusion is that at P, which is much smaller than the mass of W boson, the interactions will look like point-like interactions. Right? So this is what happens, that the low energies when the energies of interactions are much smaller than the uh, radius of interactions, these interactions look like a point line. To see this, to probe the structure, you need to go to high energies, to energies or momenta comparable with the mass of the W boson, and then you will see deviation from this point line. Then you will feel the structure. So, if your wave is is like this, then the result of scattering will depend on the exact structure of this, of this object. It's like a structure of this object. What do you mean by that? Like for, loop for having loops in the diagrams or? No, well, it's just real end this diagram. So uh -huh. you will see that these two currents, when you go to higher energies, yeah. so these two currents interact not in the same point. Yes. You will see deviation, which means that you will... So for okay. what you are doing, you are doing a computation of uh, processes, cross-section, for instance, uh, or angular distributions, right, in your cross-section. And then you do computations using this exact, more precise theory, and point-like, and compare things. Mm -hmm. So. When you have high energies, then you will have difference between what you predict for point-like mm. and with this one. Even cross-section will not say if uh, it's point-like, it increases with energy like the energy. If you have, uh, uh, if you have uh, this uh, finite size of the interaction, the increase with energy will stop. So you'll have different behavior of cross-section with the energy of your particle. And we will see it. So maybe half an hour at the end of this lecture.
So this story with Fermi theory repeats again and again. And you see, uh, here we can, we now we call this not as a theory of weak interactions, but effective theory of weak interactions. So this is, from our point of view, nowadays, is effective theory. which is valid at low energies. Because we know the true theory, and eventually we have discovered these W bosons, right? And now we know that uh, the true interactions are due to exchange of W bosons. But we should not have abandoned this one. So that gives very precise predictions of, uh, of processes at low energies. It's very small corrections. Uh, and so this is effective theory. And then at higher energies, we have more precise theory, right, with W bosons. But at low energy, it is reduced to this effective theory. The story is repeated by Weinberg, who has written a very important paper, I think it was in the 70s, saying, OK, we have standard model. But probably the standard model is also effective theory to some extent, like, like, like something like that one, which is valid at low energies. And then there is some new physics at higher energies. And if something, some new physics exists at higher energies with uh, large masses of particles involved, then at low energies, these new interactions will look like something like that. So like non-renormalizable operators. By the way, this interaction is so-called not renormalizable. So which means that with this, you cannot do uh, computations with loops, etc., because you will have divergent theory. So and then Weinberg classified possible new physics introducing or adding to the standard model some additional operators which look like, like here. So he was inspired to some extent by, by this, uh, by this uh, term theory. So we will probably discuss this a little bit later. Now, what are the lessons from this construction of the theory of uh, weak interaction? The first one, uh, so let me just summarize. It's analogy with, with electrodynamics. So the theory is Lorentz invariant. it conserves ch charge, like a charge. It's simple. So simplicity is an important criteria. Because in beta decay, four particles are involved, right? So like, like here, four particles. And so the simplest what you can write is just the product of uh, uh, corresponding operators. This is minimal which you should introduce to describe the process. Okay? Because when you compute matrix elements, so you, you need to make connections. Here you have your Hamiltonian, but here you have, say, uh, one field, this is neutron, and here you have proton, neutrino, and electron. And you need to absorb this, all these fields into operators in Hamiltonian. This is for those who made the computation. And therefore, minimum what you need to introduce is the product of four operators. What I'm saying is that actually you can construct theory using very general principles like simplicity, Lorentz invariance, and analogy. Analogy gives for me this gamma nu. So with these principles, you can find this Hamiltonian almost immediately, right? Now, as we already discussed a little bit, the theory predicts 
existence of other processes. So let me first write predictions. Using this Hamiltonian, you can make computations of the processes, rates of decays, and also energy distributions. Remember what has been measured in, uh, in, in beta decay is energy distribution of electrons emitted. And uh, with this theory, you can compute what is this energy distribution of electrons emitted. And it was in very good agreement with what has been measured. So this theory really gives a good description of, uh, of, uh, of the process. So of course, rate, you cannot predict unless you know GFM. So GFM was extracted from, from uh, uh, measurements of the rate. However, angular distribution or energy distribution is the prediction of the theory. And so the prediction was in good agreement with observations. So it gives correct energy distribution. And I mentioned already, although he used uh, vector currents for energy distribution, it gives good prediction because uh, this axial vector part uh, is more kind of sensitive. It, it produces some effects in uh, spin properties. So, but once you do summation over the spins, so you don't care what is the spin of electron in final state, you make summation, your a neutron is unpolarized as usually. You do not uh, make uh, any selection of proton spin, so which means you sum up our final spin of the proton. And uh, so with this, essentially, this gamma phi additional term uh, doesn't play any role. So, and then what happens from this Hamiltonian existence of, uh, of other processes, like inverse, beta decay. In inverse beta decay, when you have antineutrino interacting with proton and gives positron plus neutron. So this is inverse beta decay. Very important reaction which actually was used to, to discover neutrino <laughs> and it is used in present day reactor experiments. And then electron capture. So when electron, <coughs> for instance, or you can scatter electrons, is captured by proton, and this is transformed into neutron, that should be electron and neutrino. And of course you will have processes when you substitute particles by antiparticles here. You might write some more processes. So this is also a very important process. It may happen again if you have just atom and then nuclei are capture electron from atomic levels and emit neutrino. You know, uh, does the electron capture have a high cross-section if the proton is free? Uh, well, I don't know how to... You, you mean in hydrogen, so you, you will have then... You, you consider you want to consider hydrogen atom, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, I don't think so, because if you have a nuclear with bigger charge, first of all, you have closer levels, and second, you have high, bigger number of protons, I think, the capture on, on nuclei is much more efficient. And uh, you, know, uh, you said that we can uh, compute that matrix element where the in the initial state we have neutron and the final mm -hmm. state we have proton, mm -hmm. neutrino and electron. And in the final state, are you saying that these proton, neutrino and electron are free particles? Yeah. So can we make a better uh, calculation by you know, considering the fact that when an electron is emitted, it is in the electrical field of proton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the lowest order process. Of course, people then do some corrections due to interactions in final state, what you are saying. Yes, 
Yes. Well, uh, uh, that gives say observable corrections. Let me let me put it this way. But uh, so in the first approximation, you consider them as uh, as freely propagating particles. And if you have sorry, if you have the capture of uh, of uh, say electron like here on the proton, and if this happens inside the atom, of course you cannot use four electron plane wave. So you need to take a real wave function of your electron in atom. Or if in final state you say your products are captured or again so form something, then you need to to use a, a real uh, wave function. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, one more thing that we, we know that there is a positive beta thing and a negative beta. So if that, the thing that I'm asking about that you know in the end the electron is in the electrical field of the proton, it should have different effects on the positive beta decay curve and the negative beta decay. Curve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is that, is that computation easy to do or is Well, this is more involved. More involved. <laughs> okay. Well, this is that. <laughs> okay. Um, this process, as I already mentioned, is uh, was used to to discover neutrino and to detect neutrino. And uh, this time I will discuss discovery of neutrinos later. Uh, again, I will use uh, uh, chronology. But just mention what is uh, actually criteria to discover neutrino. People were thinking for a long time that neutrino is not really a real object. It's something, some phantom, something which you invented to describe some, some effectively of some unknown phenomena. And for a long time they were doubt uh, of existence of a neutrino as a particle. So, and then some criteria were formulated which would really prove that neutrino is a real particle or not something. Because, you know, you see that something is probably emitted, it looks like something, but you do not detect this. So, then I always question, maybe we do not understand dynamics very well, you know, maybe this is some kind of neutrino is just for effective description of these processes. So the criteria is the following. You need to prove that this is this particle, neutrino, propagates. From one space-time point to another space-time point. So from production point, and you need to detect this neutrino in some other space-time point. So that uh, uh, neutrino interacts with other particles in the point X2 and it transfers momentum, energy and other quantum characteristics it has. So for instance, lepton number. So that interactions here and this point in the detection will show you that you have gained some momentum, energy and uh, change your quantum numbers because of absorption of neutrino. So these are criteria for reality of neutrino. And, uh, so interestingly enough, you know, let me tell you how really uh, people were doubting existence of neutrino. Hans Bethe and Piles made the first computations of neutrino cross-sections, and I will discuss this now. Hans Bethe, in 38, has written his famous papers on how energy is released inside the stars. And he has written beta decays, the chain of the reactions, but he didn't put even neutrino. So if you look at the papers, which actually then awarded by Nobel Prize, in the processes there is no neutrinos. Because he, even he himself was kind of not completely sure. For him, even existence of neutrinos was quite speculative. 
And he has described this energy processes with energy release inside the sun and other stars without neutrinos. This is, this is a good question, and I have no good answer to this, because in principle you need to make computations, right? Yeah. So he made some estimations of, uh, of, of the uh, rates of the processes. And, uh, and he got reasonably good uh, estimations. But in this case, the neutrinos carry more, most of the energy. How yeah. did you didn't find energy? Not inside the stars. Inside the sun, it's uh, it's five percent or something like this. For supernova, yeah, then Gamow, when Gamow has written his paper, he said, "Oh, sure, we need to take into account neutrinos, and they take most of the energy in supernova, but not in this in, in the sun." So, in the first approximation, you can do that. Okay. So let me just uh, summarize uh, this criteria and what was the idea. Already at that time people formulated what one needs to do to discover neutrino. Since now we know the processes, we can say that why not to use at the source processes like beta decay when you have uh, um, proton, uh, electron, and electron antineutrino here in the source. And in the detector, we can use inverse beta decay. So this is detector. So you see, here you emit antineutrino, and this antineutrino propagates. And then in the detector, it interacts with proton, produces positron and neutron. And so the idea was to arrange this type of the experiments and to see that in the detector, which is placed at some distance from, from the source, you observe appearance of positrons and neutrons, which would testify for interactions of uh, electron antineutrinos. So that has been formulated in, in the middle of 30s, and then Hans Bett uh, and that and Piles made the first computations of this cross-section. <coughs> Bet and Piles made computations of the cross-section and uh, as you probably know the result was really very pessimistic because what they have found that cross-sections are so small and they are using Fermi theory, they were used to Fermi theory, that you need, say, one light year size of the target to have uh, interaction with probability one. Target made of water. So if you have, you know, imagine we have tube of the one light year length filled in by water, and then you <laughs> heat this by, by neutrinos, and then the probability of interaction will be of the other one. So, and people say oh, that neutrinos will be never, ever dis uh, discovered. Um, so what I will do now, I will show how this, uh, you, can, you can compute the cross-section of this process. Questions? Mm -hmm. The they use a radioactive source? Which kind of oh, you can use uh, so all these uh, beta decaying uh, nuclei, which are sources of neutrinos, yeah. are beta decays. Okay, so they estimate that this one light year is one for one neutrino. For one neutrino, yeah, so the interaction of this type. Of course, if you have huge mm -hmm. number of neutrino fluxes, mm -hmm. which became possible when nuclear reactors have been invented. Right, so that, but that time so you have this, you know, bismuth, which produces some number of neutrinos, and the flux is very small because it was not possible to, to use that. So let me mention, uh, let me just recall you what is this cross section, what we call cross section. So and my next goal is to com to to compute cross section of this process. 
So suppose we have a layer of medium detector of the length L and density is N and we have neutrinos which fell onto this uh, detector. What is the probability of interaction? The probability of interaction is of course proportional to L and I assume that uh, probability is much smaller than 1 as, as is typical for neutrinos so, which means that most of the neutrinos just cross, cross this, uh, this uh, detector without any interaction and there is no chance that neutrino will interact twice in the same, in the same detector <coughs> so therefore the probability uh, is given by the length proportional to the length of course the longer detector the more interactions density of course the denser source uh, the, the target then more interactions and then let me write here sigma which characterizes the strengths of interaction with individual with individual scatter since this is dimensionless then sigma should have dimension centimeter square right because this is centimeter this is inverse of centimeter cube and therefore this should have dimension centimeter or inverse of the mass squared okay this expression actually corresponds to the following classical picture so your neutrino entering the target she scatters and suppose the size or this area of individual scatter is sigma but actually that gives a meaning, a classical meaning then the probability of interaction will be given by a uh, total area which is occupied by scatter so over the total area of your detector right? so this area occupied by scatters over total area of the detector so uh, if I take unit size of the square then total area occupied by scatters will be given by sigma multiply it by density and multiply it by L right so that will be total number of scatterers which your neutrino will see over one because I took here uh, one centimeter square and here I measured this say in centimeter cube so that then I get this precise expression so you see from this classical picture I'm coming to the expression I have written I have written uh, here. Well, actually, uh, cross section more precisely should be interpreted in the following way. So, sigma is area. of individual scatter occupied by individual scatter multiplied by opacity so which means that you have scatter and it may have this area sigma sorry some area uh, A but it can be still partially transparent for your nutrients and you need to take into account also this so in my simplified uh, uh, 
consideration, I assume that if particle hits exactly this area, it is absorbed or interacts. But it may happen that even if it hits an area of the scatter, uh, it can still penetrate without interactions, especially in quantum, quantum theory. Questions, and uh, I will proceed with computations of, of neutrino scattering next time tomorrow. Um, confirming, confirming. I will initially propose the neutrino DT said it must have like an electron flavor. Or did he come up with the flavors? Well, flavor. Yeah, well, that, that he said the neutrino have electron neutrino generation or. Well, by that time, it just knew one generation. <laughs> the rest has been... No, of course, he, he, he didn't know. So it was just one electron, what was known, right? So muon or tau electron or tau neutrinos were discovered much, much later. Of course, no. That was not ideal pop flavor. At, at what point they realized that it must be an antineutrino instead of a neutrino? That is a good question. I think it's 50s when... Uh, uh, How or what was the reason to specify this? And the the yeah, what, why, what made this letter number to... Well, we, know, we, we don't know yet if letter number is conserved or not, at least uh, in, in, in these interactions. Uh, so again, still it's not included that neutrinos are Majorana particles, which means that neutrino coincides with antineutrino. Then the role of neutrino and antineutrino is played by, by uh, chirality, essentially. So that, so let us discuss this later. So this is the 50s, when this V minus A theory has been constructed, then it became clear that you have difference between, at least some difference between neutrino and antineutrino, what we call antineutrino. That's... Uh, so was it uh, the constructed uh, after the neutrino uh, after knowing that uh, there's violation of parity or... Oh, neutrinos was introduced much before. Violation of parity has been established in the 50s. So, so when people, again, what I'm saying, what is important, that if you have this gamma, so, you have this gamma mu. With gamma mu, with Fermi theory, there is no parity violation. It's like an electromagnetic interaction. If you want to be sensitive to some other structures, so like gamma mu, gamma phi, you need to have some kind of measurements or sensitivity to spin state of your state. Because this gamma mu, gamma phi, it is related to the spin. Okay. So it's in, 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 but the story, I will, I will discuss this story, which uh, is, is kind of interesting. How, how, it, how it was discovered. No, even you know, it's interesting that uh, <laughs> the discovery of, of, of this parity, which means asymmetry between left and right. And uh, a young scientist in, in Soviet Union with the name Shapiro, who was a student or associated to Landau, and it was uh, a tau tita problem. I will discuss this later. But anyway, he said, came to Landau, I said, so this problem. Um, can be solved if we assume that uh, there is parity violation, asymmetry between left and right. And the uh, Landau answer was, you know, really. He said, maybe, but I don't want to live in such a world. <laughs> you know, guy was really <laughs> so much scared, you know, his boss, he's kind of God, you know, he doesn't want to live in such a world. And then, is he the one after whom the Shapiro delay is named? He, sorry? No, you said the name of the scientist was Shapiro. Shapiro, yeah. So is he the one after whom the, uh, the general delay Shapiro delay is named? No, 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 it's different Shapiro. Okay. 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 Tomorrow. Probably tomorrow I will give you the first set of, of, of exercises. I think you are eagerly waiting for exercise. <laughs> <laughs> now I need to see.